Hello, everyone, um, and welcome to Communities of Care, uh, a COVID keywords conversation. And um, hi, my name is A. Preston Mint. I am the Public Events and Outreach Manager at the Headland Center for the Arts. Um, I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Um, I'm speaking to you from my home in Oakland, California, um, on the ancestral lands of the Ohlone. We'll be talking about legacies and action and remembrance a lot today. So um, wherever you might happen to be, um, just take the time to think about the actions and movements that brought you there and how we might use con today's conversation to honor that work and how our own work could help us um, to restore balance to the land and the people around us going forward. Um, I'll continue to introduce myself a little bit more in more detail along with our presenters shortly. Um, but for those of you that may not know about Headland Center for the Arts, uh, Headlands is an artist residency center in the San Francisco Bay Area, um, where we value the artistic process and offer the time, space, and resources um, to develop, research, and experiment um, new artworks and to meet and learn from other artists free from the pressures of the commodity market. Um, in recent years, we've expanded our platform to include a sort of experimental interdisciplinary program we've been calling thematic residencies. Um, and those bring together both artists and non-artists that are experts on pressing issues such as, for instance, climate equity, palliative care, or racial justice. Um, these thematic residencies have served as incubators for collaboration and new projects. Um, but they also underscore the importance of artistic vision and the artistic process in creating viable and innovative solutions to systemic political and economic problems. Um, in a recent convening, a group of artists developed a teaching tool inviting people to consider certain keywords around the debate on climate change, such as migration, waste, invasion, vulnerability, and growth words whose meanings are often assumed to be understood, but whose definitions vary greatly between individual people. And so um, the COVID keywords conversation series came about as a response to maintain contact with our audience and our artists, but also as a way to continue the kind of work promoted in our thematic residencies while we remain socially distanced. Um, our first panel was called Blackness in the American Outdoors and discussed the intersections of race visibility, safety, and access as COVID-19 transforms our relationship to an already fraught history of public space and public land. Our second conversation that was titled um, Reopening and Recovery asked us to reconsider how we value, quantify, and invest in artists, workers, and communities um, under the strain of quarantine. For now, um, today's panel will be the final installment in this series, although we at Headlands are already working on new and expanded versions of this interdisciplinary program to come in the future. Um, today, we'll talk about communities of care, um, focusing on artists, activists, and scientists working through the ongoing, and I want to underline ongoing, HIV and AIDS crisis. Um, we're going to look at what tools and lessons we could use in the age of COVID to foster communication, protest, intimacy, and mutual aid. While we have to acknowledge that there is a very different nature to these diseases and a different context to them, um, our experiences of both pandemics serve as a reminder that artists and marginalized communities often develop and use some of the most potent tools in response to crisis while institutional insistence on business and usual often magnifies harm and inequity. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, um, uh, now to the flow. Um, each section of today's conversation is gonna kind of um, free associate from certain keywords that our group has put together beforehand. Um, you'll see those kind of flash for a little bit on screen in between each section. Um, in addition to other terms and ideas that kind of came up under each of those three umbrellas um, as we were planning the conversation together. Um, so uh, I am just going to list off today's participants super fast um, before I pass the baton. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, joining us today, um, Sarit Golub, 
professor of psychology at Hunter College and the director of the Hunter Alliance for Research and Translation. Um, I'm really excited for Sri to be with us today, um, shedding a lot of expertise on just, um, you know, nuance in communication and um, uh, just kind of getting down to the root of like behavior and motivation. Um, Andrew Jolivet, um, Chair of Ethnic Studies at the University of California, San Diego. Um, uh, there's so much on here, or so much that isn't on here, um, but uh, I'll let him get into that. But just uh, a lot of work in uh, community advocacy, um, prolific writer, um, author, but maybe most pertinent today's conversation, um, the title uh, Indian Blood, HIV, and Colonial Trauma in San Francisco's Two-Spirit Community. Um, we're also being joined by Ted Kerr, um, our co-moderator for today, um, who's a writer, organizer, and artist focusing on HIV, AIDS, community, and culture, um, and uh, is also part of a collective called HIV, uh, What Would an HIV Doula Do? Um, their website is down there, hivdoula.org. I definitely suggest that you go check that out. Um, there's a lot of writing um, and just a lot of like practical how-to on, you know, how to just take care of each other. <laughs> um, so definitely check that out. Um, we're also joined by Nishi Parkinson, a motivational speaker, facilitator, activist, the list goes on, um, but also uh, the Positive Women's Action Network state lead for Missouri. Um, and then, oh yeah, that's me. Uh, <laughs> I am um, A. Preston Mint. Again, I'm a visual artist and I am also the public programs and outreach manager at Headland Center for the Arts. Um, so uh, yeah, I will pass things on to Ted to make some opening remarks to frame our conversation. Um, I'm really excited for this opportunity to collaborate with Ted again. We met um, both as participants in the Art AIDS America exhibition, um, which kind of went around the country, um, but we were both involved in the Chicago edition. Um, and uh, yeah, that show is kind of all about uh, legacies and networks and actually sort of there's a reparative element to it as well, um, kind of following a lot of critique from um, different segments of like the HIV positive community about how to sort of um, uh, represent, you know, that legacy. And so it was a really uh, um, amazing process and just, um, uh, you know, um, learning about how uh, different histories um, need to be preserved in ways that maybe institutions haven't figured out yet. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, I guess with that, I'll let Ted um, sort of open the conversation. Hi everybody, it's so nice to be here. Thank you, A, mm -hmm. Nishi, Andrew, Sarit. We're gonna have a really good time together. I'm gonna offer a few opening remarks. And um, if I think back, A, to how we met and the conditions that we met, I think so much has changed since then and having um, artists and um, caring people like yourself in positions that you're in ensures that we are doing the right thing so institutions can be um, collecting history as we're living it. So I'm really honored to be a part of this. Um, it is being recorded, so that's even more exciting. So maybe I'm speaking to you from the past and the future, so hello. Um, my name is Ted Kerr. I'm zooming in from Brooklyn, New York. I'm from Edmonton, Alberta. But like I said, I'm in Brooklyn, New York, which as you may know, is Lenape land. And as A invited you to, I reiterate, please consider the land and the history beneath your feet and how that relates to who and how we are today. Um, for those of you who are joining us primarily by listening, I'll give you a little description of myself. I'm a 40 year old white dude um, wearing a ball cap with a red neckerchief and a black t-shirt. And um, I'm wearing pants, but you don't need to know the color. Um, with that said, um, it's my honor to invite it to welcome you to Headland's event, COVID Keywords, Communities of Care. Um, this is the third event in the series that A mentioned that fosters conversation among a diversity of people asking them to tap into our creativity 
and this current moment. As I see it, the goal of today is not resolution. It is not keyword definition. I think the goal today is conversation and to inspire further conversation with the hopes that it will lead to action in your everyday lives and maybe even larger action that we take collectively. Um, today's guests, Nishi, Andrew, Sarit, and I, along with A, will consider three keywords that we kind of selected together. Identity, behavior, infrastructure. <laughs> Threading throughout these discussions will be our personal and professional experiences with HIV, COVID, and care. There's a lot to say about identity, behavior, and infrastructure when you think about HIV and COVID in relationship to care. If you think about the responses that we've been taking, whether it was 40 years ago or last week. After we travel through these words, we will open up the discussion to include you. So please use the question function on Zoom to share a query or a comment. We actually deeply look forward to that engagement. Um, today, my job is to co-moderate. I will keep the conversation going, knowing that it will not be hard with this panel. We'll each introduce themselves in a minute. Um, maybe I will be much like last night's moderator at the, at the debate, and I will have to fight to be heard myself. I hope so. That should be fun. Um, but before we do that, I want to set the tone for our time together by saying grief is welcome here. Grief is welcome here. In the last four months, I personally have lost people and I'm having a long, hard time learning how to grieve in this moment where there's so much reckoning happen. What is it to cry amid mass death? What is it to be depressed when people are taking to the streets to change the world? How is it to be depressed anyway? <laughs> how am I supposed to make sense of so many people who have lived long term with HIV who are dying in this present? I'm not great at all this feeling. Um, but something that helps me is that uh, I know I'm not alone in the struggle. So many of us have spent so much of our lives keeping it together, keeping it tight, because we had to, to work, to support our friends and family, to fit in, to not get kicked out. And because maybe along the way we fell out of touch with our bodies or our communities or our ancestors or our ways, or maybe those things were stolen or hidden from us. But as we enter another season of pandemics and protest, at least for the duration of this Zoom call, please consider at the very least we can do for ourselves and each other, the living and the dead, is make space for our hearts. To name what we have lost, what we have done together, and together, however we can, in the names of everything we need and everything we're dreaming of. I say all this as someone who's been working 20 years in the field of uh, art, AIDS, and activism in the US and Canada, and who since the COVID-19 pandemic began has been working with what would an HIV doula do um, to build upon the things that we have all learned through HIV and to think about how we can apply it now. So we see a doula as somebody who holds space during times of transition. And we understand that HIV and certainly COVID is a series of transitions that start long before you wonder if you should get a test and exist long after um, we may have passed away on this earth. One thing our collective knows for sure is that since no one gets HIV or any illness alone, none of us should have to deal with illness alone. Together is a method of healing. I say all this also as someone who has tested negative for HIV and for the coronavirus, yet has been shaped by both. I invite you to not only think about what is in your blood, what is in your lungs, or what is in your body more generally, but to consider the role that illness has on the shape of your world. How much of your life is dictated by wellness, by ideas of public health, contagion, and strength? How has genocide affected what we think of as medicine? What role does climate change play in the future availability of the pills we all may need to stay alive? What is the role of laughter in saving a life? When was the last time a healthcare professional asked you about pleasure? And how can taking notes today, whether that's drawing or writing, help you absorb the brilliance that you're about to hear from my friends? And with that, with our grief, our bodies, our power, and our collective viral load, I thank you all for being here and invite our panelists to each take their two to three minutes to introduce themselves. So let's start with Nishi, then go to Sarit, and then hear from Andrew. After that, we'll start with our keywords. Nishi? 
Hi, good day, everyone. My name is Nishi Parkinson. I am the Missouri State Lead for Positive Women Network. Our envision, we envision a world where women living with HIV can live long lives, healthy and dignified and productive lives, free from stigma, stigma and discrimination. So I come to you from the state of Missouri, St. Louis. I have been living with HIV for two decades and I am a fierce badass woman coming to the platform today to rejuvenate and balance the self-esteem, isolation, and cultural in one place with one monologue. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Sari Golub. I use uh, she, her pronouns. Um, as A said, I'm a psychologist. Part of, a very strong part of my identity is that I teach at City University of New York, which is the largest public university in our country. Um, and I am a, a born and bred proud New Yorker. Um, I have the distinction of having worked in all five boroughs of New York City, which for those of you who know New York, is not something that every New Yorker can say. Um, and part of my identity in my work and my life is as um, a challenger or a dismantler of false dichotomies. Um, and I'll just like mention a couple. So sort of overarching in my life are things like mind body, science versus art, positive versus negative, subjectivity versus objectivity, research versus practice. And relevant, I think, particularly for this forum, um, health and safety versus the economy, <laughs> or um, personal versus social responsibility. And I'm really looking forward to, in this keyword conversation, talking um, with these amazing folks that um, I've had the um, good fortune to get to know through this process about how we can challenge this type of dichotomous thinking and move toward holistic perspectives that really allow us to bring our whole selves to the, the present moment and the current challenges that we're facing. COVID-19, AKA coronavirus two. Infection, no cure, weaponized, anti-black, mask off. But who wears the mask? Not black boys, not black trans women, not Brianna, not Ahmad, not George, not Harlem, nor Hunters Point, nor Ninth Ward. Pandemic. But what about Henrietta Lacks? Mm. What about Tuskegee? What about running face sickness, smallpox? But what about our grandmothers? Where were the masks hidden inside diseased slave ships upon dead bodies? Don't touch me. Don't touch that. You'll get it. They spread it. I wanted to share just the beginning part of this poem. Um, I won't read the whole thing because we're just doing introductions, but just to contextualize, uh, first of all, you told we hope you greetings, good day, relatives. I uh, greet you in the Ishak language of my ancestors. And um, I think it's when we think about the notion of disease, whether that was HIV um, or continues to be HIV in many ways, or we think about COVID and the intersections of um, these things, I think that poem, the rest of it really was about, I had to, I, I was just having this visceral kind of reaction when things started seven months ago and then said, you know, people are talking about this in so many similar ways as someone, I was diagnosed with AIDS 18 years ago next month, I had 32 T cells, just got my labs back uh, two days ago, 1180, so we're at that 1200 um, mark, so it's it's been a journey. Um, and for me, I think COVID is another extension of um, this notion of deserving, you know, responsibility, um, what one should be doing, what we really need to be thinking about, where did these, where did these conditions exist in the first place, just like smallpox or, you know, uh, things that happen to folks like Henrietta Lacks or the forced sterilization of Black and Indigenous women. So I think we really need to look at these sort of structural issues. So again, uh, my name is Andrew <laughs> and I'm a professor in uh, ethnic studies at UC San Diego uh, talking today from Kumeyaay territory, also direct Native American Indigenous Studies um, uh, at UCSD and chair of the ethnic studies department. And um, 
what else did I, there was one other thing I think I wanted to say about that. Um, yeah, just thanks for having me for the, the conversation. I think this is really important, important work, so. Hey, do we have a fancy graphic or no? We do. Ooh. I will show it to you now. <laughs> so. Uh, welcome to the first term, identity. So uh, before we gathered here today, we had um, some email conversations in, the, uh, in Zoom conversation where we talked about identity. And some of the larger themes that came up were culture, disability, women, clean, dirty, vector illness, such an intense list to just uh, rattle off. But anyway, um, what I would like to start with, though, is to ground us in the viruses to make sure that we don't lose track of that. And so I wonder if any of you wants to start by just naming, like, what are the identities of, of HIV? What are the identities of COVID? And it's a little bit of a weird question, so feel free to take it wherever you want. And I will say, Andrew, I think you already started us off with that poem. Yeah, I mean, when I think about identity and HIV or COVID or things like disease, I think about bodies, different types of bodies, and the, the disposability of um, black, brown bodies, in particular women's bodies. Um, I think about an idea for thinking of key words, right? Social death, right? The ways in which we can be living, but in, in the way in which our bodies are policed, regulated, um, the insecurities that we have to deal with as a result of having those bodies um, policed in particular ways, um, you know, is really in, in, incredible. I think for myself and my story, what I was saying, you know, when I was diagnosed with AIDS, uh, I was 27, 2002, and I wasn't even thinking about as someone who was in the middle of finishing a PhD, you kind of the stereotype, oh, you have all this knowledge, like the discourse around, oh, well, why would, you know, you should, you know, you should be the last person who should have gotten this, right? You should have known better, like these different things, which there's so many assumptions already in that, right? That's marked in it um, about behavior, because no one knows what that my behavior was like. Um, but what I think was also interesting for me was because of the ways in which bodies are marked differently, um, and particularly in the context, I'll say of HIV and AIDS, but I think I'm seeing it with COVID too, like queer folks being overrepresented, you know, with HIV AIDS, folks of color being overrepresented, but then there being that disconnect between those identities. So for me as a gay man of color, I was not really never felt like great in the Castro. People are always like, ooh, Castro, San Francisco, you know, and I'm like, no, it's not. I was like, it's one of the most racist places I've ever been. I mean, Badlands just closed all these places that have these long histories, you know, of being racially discriminatory. And so um, I think identity is definitely for me, um, how do we link the different intersections, um, whether that's sexual orientation or gender, or race, et cetera, class um, are really important. Sarat, I wonder if you have thoughts about identity and the viruses. Is that something that you think about in your work, either just as a human being or as a researcher? Did you say me? Is that what you said? Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think, uh, you know, all the things that Andrew brought up, um, I think are super important. The other sort of way in which I think about it is the ways in which individuals think about the place of illness within our own identities. And, um, you know, we think all the time, at least I think all the time about the language that people use. Um, and I think that we are, um, we've moved so far in terms of recognizing the importance of people first language as opposed to labeling language. But I think that there is this um, way in which when we are sick with a, um, a more acute illness, something that's going to pass, we often speak about, um, about not being ourselves, I'm not myself. Or when we get well, we say, oh, I'm finally back to myself again. Um, and this language takes, right, that takes illness as something that is inherently not me, not part of my identity, right? So when we are living with chronic illness, 
how do we then integrate something that is not, I, I can't wait to be myself again. This is now something that has to be tremendous um, insights and strengths that people living with HIV have taught us about how to, how to, how to make identity consonant. Um, and I think that this teaches us something about distance and, and moving toward around um, COVID as well. To the extent that we other illness itself, we are constantly trying to understand why those people have gotten sick, which is something that Andrew really raised before. And, and that's what, because it's those people with that identity, it's not gonna happen to me. And I think that only when we overcome that and are able to have a more integrative identity and understand that like illness and health, not dichotomies, these exist on a spectrum. And you can be living with a chronic illness and be healthy. And that I think is something that we, we, we need to, um, to play with. You feel free to react to anything you can respond to my question, but I bet you the stuff that Sreet said that you're feeling. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, Ted. So I want to um, say this. Self-control, self-esteem, self-empowerment, self-love, self-guidance, self-care, self-awareness and environment, self. Why not yourself? So with that being said, as I started off earlier, I'm a woman living with HIV for two decades. When I was diagnosed in 1997, it was a new adaptation to my life. I had to learn the process. I had to, you know, walk through case management services and really hone in on being a 17 year old young child, teenager and looking for direction. So self identity looks different. Uh, moving forward, being 42 years of age, self-identity looks different again. Um, I'm a mom, I'm a single mom uh, with an 18 year old who's trying to self-identify who she is today. Um, even though I provided self-guidance, self-love, self-empowerment, and self-worth through the work that I do 100% of the time in her life as being a mom, how do we turn on those identities that really associate ourselves with self because self-identity social the sociology behind that the world wants us to identify to what they want it to be for us instead of allowing it to allow our identities to manifest into the universe for ourselves so we have to walk a certain way we have to look a certain way we have to talk a certain way and being a black woman it's very hard to walk in certain spaces and be accepted or they ask you to dim your light or dim your emotions, or your emotions are not accepted here. So how do you sit at those different tables, being a woman, being a woman of color, and being able to speak loud and bold and continue to be fierce in your own self-worth? Um, isolation happens when you don't have your self-worth or you don't have your self-empowerment. Stigma plays a part in your self-identity. You know, who's gonna accept me? Um, it's the three letter word HIV, planted on my forehead, um, how will people perceive me under self-worth or self-identity? How am I supposed to walk, talk? Um, am I too big? Am I too fat? Am I too skinny? All of those things play in the self-identity piece. Um, living with a diagnosis of either COVID-19 or HIV is self-identified. You know, when people are trying to go into those vaccine studies um, to help the scientists come up with a great vaccine for us to cure or minimize the effects of COVID-19. You hear the commercials. Who will know that I stepped into a vaccine study? Will my name be used in the commercial or uh, demographics be used? All of those millions and millions of questions are asked about self-identity. Thank you. That was very helpful. There's so much information there. And I mean, before we move on to the next thing, I, I am kind of curious, I'm gonna circle back just a little bit, because I do want us to think 
about the viruses as things, as material realities that exist in some people's body and not. And we've all done a really good job of thinking about the social identity of, of these viruses, but I wonder, do you think about the actual physical thing, the actual physical virus in your body or in the body of someone you love? And maybe as you're answering that, think about some of the stuff that Sarit said around integration. Right. I know for me, a lot of the times when I think of illness, I, I really responded to what Siri said about this idea that it being outside and I don't want it inside. But then to Nishi and Andrew's point, it's like it is inside of us regardless. Not all of us are living with HIV, but we are we are descendants of history and there's these ways in which illnesses are circling around us. So can you just talk about like what do, when you close your eyes and think of a virus, what do you see? I'm glad you asked this question. I mean, it also made me think of what Sarit was saying about the integration and how you start to think of yourself as different and whether, you know, how disease can become a part of your body. But And so that, how do you think about that? You know, a couple points I want to share just on your, your question here. And that's the first one of my mentors, I remember Rafael Diaz, who wrote the book, a uh, book called Gay Latino Men and HIV. And Raphael used to say, he'd say, you know, people don't walk around going around saying, oh, I am cancer, right? We don't say, oh, I am HIV. It's like I have or I'm living with HIV. He said, you know, it's such a different kind of state of mind where you become that thing, right? And that it possesses your body. Um, another experience I had was when I, after, right after I was diagnosed, some friends um, had organized a, a pipe ceremony uh, led by a, a, another friend of ours, a Diné medicine person. And Dan, um, the, the, the medicine person who led the, the ceremony, he told me at one point, he turned to me and he said, um, as he was placing medicine on my chest, Andrew, you can't think of yourself as sick. You're not sick. He said, you have a story to tell and a lot of people out in our communities aren't able to tell those stories. It's kind of like even your opening, right? Um, in our own words, in our own voices, people have asked me over the years, why do you talk so publicly about being positive? I said, I feel I have a responsibility. That doesn't mean everybody has to. Um, and so he said, you, you, th those are your brothers, those are your sisters, that's your medicine. Your community is your medicine. And so when you ask about body, and integrating and think of thinking about disease. I don't think about, I think about HIV as a relative, maybe in some ways in my experience. Um, but I also like one that I will talk with and have a relationship with or have over the over time. But I also, I think you can't let it become this negative part, like the relative you never want to see. So you're just like, oh, uh, let me forget about you. Cause you can always also close that off. Um, but I used to make jokes. Like I know one of my partners, my ex, we just, who was one of them was also positive and we'd say, oh, we're going to name, because they're both taking Kalitra at the time. And we're like, we're going to name our daughter. If we ever have a daughter, we're going to name her Kalitra. <laughs> um, so I think there's ways in which you, you also have to, when you're living with this stuff, um, living with, right? Um, I think that what are the ways in which you thrive and just thinking about other people who are long-term survivors even longer. I think it's even more than being a survivor, right? I think that also speaks to this notion of body and how we see ourselves as having this something inside, am I gonna die? Like I also was diagnosed about five, six years of prostate cancer at stage one. And it's interesting because you think you know there's this thing in your body. This is very different, right? Because HIV is controlled, they're monitoring the problem. But some people look at me, even some of the doctors who aren't urologists and they're like, why did you take, why haven't you done anything yet? You know, I'm monitoring it. Actually, my, the specialist I saw was like, you don't, you're young, you don't need, it's very slow growing. And it's been fine. It's been like five, six years. In fact, the last biopsy, they didn't even see any cancer. Um, but it is an interesting thing to know something is in your body that could quote, kill you. Um, but anything can, right? At any moment. So we just have to think about that relationship and not let it overtake us and become our, become our identity where it is, like Raphael says, I'm HIV positive rather than I'm living with HIV. So I want to touch base on this. Words matter, right? Choose them carefully. Words have power. We need to talk about HIV, but we need to do it in a way that protects and respects the humanity and dignity of people living with HIV. 
Language that implies judgment and shameful fuel stigma, which kills people, put them in isolation and keep the epidemic alive. Replacing those words of like HIV infected and saying persons living with HIV matters. HIV AIDS patients living with HIV infected or infected. I'd rather for you to say diagnosed with HIV, contracted HIV, acquired HIV, or transmit HIV. I'm not a person that died of AIDS. Died of AIDS related complications. That's a more effective word or wording to use. Words matter. No, I do not have full blown AIDS. I'm a person living with HIV. I'm a person that died from AIDS related uh, complications. This is not a medical condition. Use age or three stages or the third stage of HIV. Risky or unprotected sex. I would prefer you to do and be specific and say condomless sex. I love all of this. This is amazing. Um, I, I want to go back to something that and the, the language that Andrew used as a relative and contrast it with the language that we hear all the time, both for HIV and for COVID around like invader. There's like all of this like militaristic language. And I think that that is part of this. I mean, you if you are fighting against something, it can't be a relative. Well, for yeah. some of us it can, but you know what I mean? Like, um, and so I think that that's, and, and what that made me think, and, and this connects to, to what Nishi was saying, saying before, the, the, the contrast between identity as something that we claim versus identity that is placed upon us by mm -hmm. others. And Nishi, before I, I heard you talk about those two different experiences, the experience of, okay, this, I'm going to claim this, I, these aspects of my identity for myself, as opposed to the ways in which um, other people might see me, label me, place these words upon me. And I think, like, I think that that, and for some reason, and maybe you guys can explain this to me, I wrote down while both of you were talking, too much. This is something that I am called often. <laughs> <laughs> um, too much. And I like, you know, like, could you, could you just tone it down a little bit? And I wonder whether there's a way in which these identities or the, the true and full claiming of these identities or breaking down dichotomies, for example, between sort of like, like science and art or like virus and identity is part of what it means to be too much. And does that resonate with people at all? I think you all should answer that question. And basically you've also get, gotten us into behavior this idea of too much as a behavior. So um, yeah, now I'm stepping back and saying, Nishi and Andrew, you have the best question ever, the too much question. Too much question, right? Don't let anyone dim your light because being too much could risk someone else's life. You need to be too much. You need to be at the table. You need to provide the guidance because knowledge is power. Education reduces discrimination. It reduces the behavior inflicted on people with trauma, right? It allows us to walk through our journey as anyone else. So reducing the, uh, the di discrimination and educating your counterpartners and your colleagues that you walk into the room with. Don't be dimming your light because you too much. Be too much. Be a badass too much. Yeah, I don't, I, I co-sign that. I don't, I don't even, I'm, I'm looking for even another word. I don't think, this is the thing I've really important to me in the last, I don't know, couple of years is really words, as, as Nisha was saying, it, you know, they matter and what we choose to, you know, speak on. And so I wouldn't even use that anymore, right? Because I think saying too much is so loaded um, are you, oh, she's too much, or this person's too much, they need to come, go sit down, you know, kind of, it's, it's a silencing, it's a way to silence folks, right? Um, and so I think that's really important, but I do want to kind of also touch on what you were saying about the military sort of feel, right, that you're at war, right? And for me, that does speak to this sort of behavioral, you know, 
history around disease, right? Condom usage, are you wearing a mask for COVID? Are you washing your hands? Dirty, diseased, clean. The, um, the conversation that was just, we were talking about what's safe sex, right? Or risky sex, right? Who's determining all these things that, who controls that? And so that's built into the infrastructure, right? That is controlled by colonial forces, right? By those who are out doing all this stuff, they're critiquing people. How many of these senators, right, who've been caught doing the very same things that they are policing women's bodies or queer and trans people's bodies about? Um, and then some, right? I mean, do it in the light of day then, right? Be too much, right? Be real is what it is. And I think maybe that's what it is. It's not too much, it's be real. Um, and so I think that's the other piece that we still have to address is when we think about the identity, we think about the behavior, and then we take it to the infrastructure, it's how do we refocus and shift that infrastructure so that it's functioning in a way that we recognize in our communities, that we're determining that language, that we're not living, because what happened, right, is now, as I wrote in the chat to you all when you were talking about the military thing, it's just like the war on drugs, right? All these things that we say we're warring against, but then it also has just become a medical industrial complex then where, you know, we all know about the drugs for HIV. Now it's about the vaccine, what company is going to get access to that. So how do how are our bodies again become commodity in this, right? How are Black, Indigenous, POC folks, queer folks, uh, working class, immigrant folks, bodies being commodity in the search for a vaccine or um you know in terms of drugs that you know we've had to take to um live you know with hiv and, and other things so those are my thoughts on those things yeah and i think I mean, just, oh, go ahead <laughs> when we look at the behavior right and we look at the um domino effect that has happened the crippling um conversations that have harmed our community in regards to drugs, sex, body autonomy, living with COVID-19 or HIV, herpes, any of the STIs that are out there. If you got herpes in high school, you were the, ooh, you got something, you know. So now the language that we're using against um, all people in, in the world, we walk with something. If it's diabetes, if it's cancer, is it, if it's it's HIV, if it's hypertension, you know, a, a autoimmune system, we're walking, people are walking with something. So what is it that affects us differently, knowing that we're HIV positive and we live bold and we live fierce and we're, we're open about our statuses? What makes us, what makes us different? I have a bachelor's degree in uh, uh, li liberal studies, right? What makes me different? I'm a single mom. What makes me different? I can go after the same exact things that persons not living with HIV have. And to, you know, criminalize, criminalize us in this way um, is harmful. We're already walking through police brutality and trauma and not able to grieve through COVID-19 and the losses that we've lost. Enough is enough. Mm -hmm. Take it away, Ace. Hey. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> well, actually, maybe I'll just uh, flash our little brainstorm card uh, while I talk. Um, and yeah, I think just as we sort of segue into behavior, I think one, one thing that's been really interesting about everything, everyone that everyone's been saying is, especially this idea of sort of like how so when we're talking about behavior, you know, we're talking about like prevention and response, basically, in this context, um, right? And sort of how how do we encourage behavior that is the most effective response, right? And so I think there's a lot, and again, maybe we're getting into uh, Sarit can kind of challenge this dichotomy, right? <laughs> um, but just like between sort of like this moral response and like a scientific response or a scientific slash behavioral slash cultural response. And I think the war paradigm is such a moral response, right, in a, in a lot of ways where it's like we're fighting this disease, like there's the antagonist protagonist, right? And, and the problem going back to identity is, right, like we talked about um, uh, sickness as being othering, right? When you live with a chronic disease, 
you have to become the other in a sense. Like there's no separation, it's not temporary, right? And in that sense, you also get othered, right? Because you are now associated <laughs> with this disease. And so, you know, when, when you, we use these sort of antagonistic terms, right, it oversimplifies things. And we start looking at like these other sort of unproductive dichotomies, like, um, you know, like saying this is safe, that's unsafe, you're being safe, this group is, is unsafe, that, you know, and, and we're not actually looking at sort of a complex set of behaviors and interactions that are, that have different degrees, right? You know, like, I think we can say uh, all sorts of science for all sorts of things say like we should be washing our hands more, <laughs> right? <laughs> like, you know, like that is like, you know, a, a behavioral response that I think, you know, a lot of, you know, like we can kind of talk about, um, right? On the other hand, it doesn't get into, say, because of people's identities, like who has access to clean water to wash their hands with, <laughs> right? Um, and I think it also, um, uh, um, when we dig ourselves too deep into these categories, we kind of forget interconnectedness, right? And so, you know, just because you aren't in high risk group X, whatever that means, then you, I don't have to worry about that, right? Like I have, like there's so many, I'm sure there are a lot of people who are interested in HIV activism or the history of HIV that are watching this that like don't know that we have medical technology that like pretty much completely manages the disease, right? Like, and so, and you know, and, and it's because they either themselves have self-selected out of the group that would receive that information um, or because the medical industry does not think that they need to hear that information and so they're not being targeted, right? So. Um, yeah, I guess I just sort of did like a big splurge of, of thoughts and feelings, but, you know, maybe, maybe we can kind of talk about how identity and behavior sort of coalesce in that way. I, <laughs> so I, I want to like, I mean, so many things that you said, I feel like, like generated stuff in my head. I think it's really important to name the fact that a lot of public health advice or I don't know what the right word is, is actually an agent of social control. And that it is, I mean, even just like, and I'll just give you an example, the difference between the, the phrase that you used, which is, we should all be washing our hands more versus we need to make it as easy as possible for people to wash their hands. <laughs> and that, like that, right? Which like, and, and that, it, the, all of the ways in which, and I mean, this goes like, this gets to the infrastructure, which is like the way that Andrew was like, there is no difference between identity, behavior, and infrastructure. <laughs> um, because, like, in order to create behavior, we have to create infrastructure. However, if we are using if we're using this type of behavior as a form of social control, then we place all of that on the individual in the absence of infrastructure. And I think it is so super important to keep that in mind. Um, and that happened so much with HIV. Condomless sex is a amazing thing. And like, and we demonized it as if that were the problem in and of itself. The problem that we needed to solve is how can we make sure that people can have incredibly intimate and yes, condomless sex and keep themselves as healthy as possible. And similarly, he, with COVID, it is like, I, I just worry that we are getting into this mindset where we think that hugging mm -hmm. or being close, like, what are those people doing? They want to get together? Of course they do. Of course they do. And so as opposed to like, we need to make sure that people social distance, 
What we need to be solving for is how do we create systems and infrastructure in which people can be together and still stay as healthy as possible. And, and, and I just think like, and, 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 there, and the, um, <laughs> the forces are not um, benevolent. They are not. Their, their intention is to keep us separate. I'm like not to be too whatever, but like is to like squash gay sex and to um, keep people separated, like no doubt. And so I just feel like we have to name that. And I'm like, I'm part of the public health establishment, but you know what I mean? How do we balance all the brilliance that you just said with the mask denialists, with the people who think that COVID, like I don't need to social distance. Like how do we balance this very true thing that you're saying and not go too far, or I won't even say too far the other way because that gets into binary thinking, but you know, a lot of what you just said could be used by COVID denialists as, as fuel. So I don't think so because the goal there, right? The goal is not about, is about a different type of social control. It's about my ability to exert my will and my control over you, which is like, which is a different type of, of advice and behavior. I don't know. I've been talking too much. I'll shut up. Uh, but I don't know what other folks. I, I think with the social, social control, right? They don't want to own it. They don't want to have accountability for it. They want to block it out. Uh, it doesn't affect me. It doesn't affect me. I live in rural Missouri, right? So we live on the outskirts of St. Louis. And, you know, the big gripe around sports. Our area of Arnold, Missouri, um, our teenagers at the high school are able to do contact sport. So do we mask on or mask off? Do we social distance in the bleachers? Or do we have social control with checking it? Do we do the temperature, the proper hand washing before entering, you know, establishments and things of that nature? Um, do we know about the long wait times or reduce the wait times or um, setting the table six feet apart? Do we have that social control? Do we really want to own that social control? Um, because we're going to miss a dollar or a cent or a penny or 50 million or trillions of bucks. So it's all controlled by the monopoly of marketing, right? We lose because of social control, because they feel like social control has fell out the bottom, is at the bottom, it's not there, I'm missing something. The advice to anyone is to protect yourself. Protecting yourself with HIV transmission, reducing the risk, getting on PrEP is a possibility. Reducing the risk of COVID-19 is proper hand washing, staying home when you're sick, doing the norm, the things that your mother and father told you to do when you were little kids. So what's the difference of the social control? Yeah, I think there's a real difference. I mean, going back again to Raphael, one of the things I know we used to talk about, and I kind of looked at in the HIV book too, is it's really about how do you help folks to enact their own safer sex intentions if it's HIV? So I think what Sarit's getting at here, right, is totally different, right? It's actually about encouraging folks to take social responsibility in their own terms, ways, um, and, you know, giving folks maybe the information, but also not creating these campaigns where it becomes you're a bad person, right? If you don't do this, if you don't do that. Because I was feeling, even I'll say that about COVID as it first started, right? The sort of shaming that people were doing this is before I would say it was really early still, but look at all those people going out to the, the club and, you know, all these different things. And I was like, God, this sounds like HIV, you know, this kind of, you know, it's your fault because you went here. I mean, I don't think they're going because they want to get it right. But they're like, well, you knew what the risks were, right? When you went out there, just like, oh, you knew there was a possibility if you slept with those people and didn't use a condom. So I think there is something there but there's also that something different about these um these patterns and i think all of it comes down to um the intentionality there right um it's not just um about some oh freedom right which i think a lot of people who are 
sort of the anti non-believer folks are saying this is against my freedoms this is the worst thing since slavery all these weird odd you know sort of things you're hearing people saying about quote unquote civil liberties um and so you know i think that again this gets at why we have so many struggles over control one thing we maybe talked a little bit about but it's really it's all this stuff is about ideology i think it's political ideology who controls it access to education but not just education education that allows folks to get closer to their own liberation and freedom right um and to not be tied because then you can have a, a da in kentucky who's a black person who says no I'm not going to make these kind of charges, um, you know, against these officers who shot this black woman, Breonna Taylor, and then today <laughs> say, oh, and also I'm going to block, right, you all from getting access to the grand jury proceedings, right? So you know, so even so, my point in sharing that is part of it is how do how does ideology become internalized even in marginalized communities so that we can't enact our own better intentions for ourselves, right? Um, so I think that the, this is the, those things are really really important. So, yeah. Sri, I think you have more to say. I can feel it. No, no. Okay. So we've already started on infrastructure. So I think we should just keep going in that. And um, what I want to say. So some of the things that we talked about was commons, efficiency, mutual aid, profit, protest, public health resources, and public. There's in brackets. Um, an amazing thinker out of Canada named Gary Kinsman often asks, who is the public in public health? And I think that's something that we're, we're grappling with here. Um, the first time I ever got to meet you, Suri, we had a discussion and you said something that has forever blown my mind and, and maybe other people understand it already, but this idea that the reason why there was so much, much backlash when PrEP came onto the scene is be, and same with the pill, this, was your, this is your thinking, so if I get it wrong, you know, correct it. The reason why there's backlash with PrEP and the pill is because the powers that be, that are white, cis, straight men, think that there has to be a cost for pleasure for the people that are marginalized or who are further marginalized, as to Andrew's point in the chat. And that the reason why this backlash happens is because people are about to get pleasure without consequences. I'm putting consequences in quotation marks here. And I would love us to think about that in relationship to infrastructure, COVID and HIV. And Sri, why don't you start us off and correct everything that I got wrong and then no, just jump totally off. Right. I mean, I was, I was, I think that the story that I may have told you is that when I first started um, training uh, medical providers to prescribe PrEP, um, one of the doctors in one of my trainings said to me, wait a minute, if we give gay men this drug, they're gonna be able to have as much sex as they want and they won't get HIV. And I was like, yeah, <laughs> isn't that great? <laughs> um, but there was this definite, and, and the other thing that I think is important to sort of raise up here is, you know, the ways in which the HIV movement, if we could call it a movement, and the LGBTQ liberation movement, if we can call it a movement, have intertwined themselves in ways that have left black and brown and trans siblings behind. And I think that this is, an, that this is another lesson that I think we need to make sure so like to connect this to infrastructure, every single time a new intervention, public health intervention for HIV was introduced, it exacerbated instead of reduced uh, health disparities and health inequity. Like when combination therapy was introduced, it exacerbated the mortality rates between white and black and brown people living with HIV. When HIV testing even was introduced, um, it, it did this. And when PrEP was introduced, it, it, it exacerbated um, disparities in infection rates. And so I know, I know 
that in the same way that we see these health inequities now with COVID, the minute that a vaccine is introduced, an effective treatment is introduced, better testing is introduced, it's gonna exacerbate health inequity and not reduce it. And that to me is what we need to be ever constantly vigilant about right now and yell and scream about and be too much about right now um, because it's coming. Yeah, and it's, um, I'm just gonna say one little factoid or whatever, but I think it's, it's recently, recently um, numbers are coming back. There was a question in the Q&A about sort of um, how, how um, doctors and nurses have been sort of drafted in the war, you know, <laughs> um, against COVID and how that's really sort of unfair and manipulative and dangerous. And um, uh, nurses of color are getting sick and dying at higher rates than their white counterparts. Um, from COVID. So it's our, like we already have the information on this disparity that you're talking about in the, the quote unquote front line, right? <laughs> if you, which is also another sort of problematic military. Which, and, and there was disparity in the beginning of the HIV epidemic also, but the interesting thing is that new innovation even made those disparities bigger. And, that, and, and that's like, you know, you, you always think that like innovation is supposed to to narrow health inequity, not exacerbate it. And that has to do with distribution and, and attention with, within our When I think of infrastructure, I think of like what has to carry the weight, what has to do the holding. And Nishi, we got to work on a project a few months ago where we made a beautiful poster for a, for a, for, um, a conference. And, Finding time to work on it was like magic, kind of. It was hard because you are infrastructure for so many people. You're not only raising your 18-year-old daughter, who is a beauty queen, literally. Um, you're also taking care of your family. You're also a community connect, right? Like I know, I literally know because of my time in St. Louis and Missouri, how many people look to you for support. Meanwhile, you're also like, you're a human being, so you have stuff too. So I wonder if you want to talk a little bit about the personal, the personal relationship to infrastructure for you and what it's like during this time? Well, the personal infrastructure for me at this time, everybody wants, 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 right? They want you to do this piece, that piece, that piece, that piece, and they forget that you're human. Um, and they have deadlines to meet and they want to talk and, and, and really challenge your brain to talk about COVID-19, HIV-related um, situations. And I had an opportunity to um, recently meet with a journalist um, talking about COVID-19 and HIV and the health disparities. Um, for me, I feel with the infrastructure piece, I think um, when COVID-19 really hit the scenes, um, people were frantic, right? People didn't know what to do. Um, they didn't know what was going to be for the future. And we still don't know what's gonna be for the future. But I think they missed the mark when, um, they did not allow access. Access to really look at the community geographically and to really look at what the trends were when we uh, stepped into HIV epidemic, right? They did not take the trends that we learned from that mm -hmm. epidemic to use it for this pandemic that we're walking in. The science was already there. The information was already there. Um, you know where those marginalized communities are. You know um, what is lacking for us, mutual aid, um, delivering things on the ground and making sure people had um, access to masks and um, hygiene items and things like that. So it all really rolls back to um, being pulled from different directions under infrastructure. And then you have this hierarchy of need, right? You have the people at the the top and then you have the people all the way down at the bottom um, that really know more than the people at the top uh, because we work it every day we, we're in it we're on the ground we're community driven we're the pillars of the community um, we're able to diffuse because we know geographically where we need to be and how we need to position ourselves and being a stakeholder and a community engager the narratives are already built so you have to go to those individuals to really map out a plan to be able to walk through those communities and be afforded those um, access points in the community. Because it's just like having great bedside manners um, in a hospital setting. If you get a doctor that you don't know, you're not gonna open up to him or her. 
where's your primary care physician? So you have to use that as an analogy when you want to get into connections and being able to be the fuel for that infrastructure to use it to the best of your ability. Um, to be able to know that this is a public health crisis, right? But we have to use those people that are the gatekeepers to get into those communities. I look at the, um, cens the census situation that we have, where we know that the North City um, of St. Louis um, did not really open their doors for the census workers to come to get that information, that quantitative information to get the monies that are gonna be needed for those communities, right? And we failed ourselves because we did not allow access to happen in a meaningful way and we did not talk it through. So me being, you know, versatile and in the uh, community and organizing and mobilizing, I used my skill set, you know, to be able to help individuals in the community. Um, and Ted, the programs that we've worked on in the past um, at that conference has been meaningful for individuals to be able to have access and be able to be at the table to talk about, you know, those history driven pieces to afford our community access for all. And the common response of COVID-19 um, needs to be upgraded because that second and third wave is coming. It's a public health issue. Hey, how are we doing for time? What do we need to do? We're doing okay for time. We should sort of start wrapping, um, but there's, but not really like wrapping, wrap, you know, like cadence, okay. the cadence out. Okay. Although we do have um, a question that actually does have to do with infrastructure. Um, so it's kind of like, we can kind of get into the Q&A while like- You have two that, jobs. Yeah, have to not treat it as a separate thing. Um, you have to tell but, us the question and you yeah. have to introduce us to your cat. Oh, okay. Yeah. So first the cat, <laughs> this is Kitchen. She's amazing. She's 15. Hi. Um, she's welcome on all of my Zoom calls. Um, <laughs> and uh, the question, uh, it kind of dovetails into something I've been thinking about too. It's from an anonymous person. Um, but I, I guess I also want to take the time to say if anyone else has a question, now's the time to start. Uh, getting that flowing. Um, so feel free to type that in the Q&A box, which is at the bottom of your Zoom interface. Um, <clears throat> and uh, yeah, so um, this person is saying, uh, re-infrastructure, curious to hear thoughts on self-care versus communal wellness. Why is self-care prized and valued where it's taking care of others and having a shared responsibility for the wellness of others is undervalued or ignored? And I kind of want to piggyback on this with two things. One, I bet Sarit has something to say about a dichotomy between self-care and community care. And second of all, um, uh, I was sort of thinking, you know, we were kind of talking about, and Ted, you were saying this too, it's like, you know, we don't, um, we're not necessarily advocating this at all, but there's a way people could like misconstrue um, some of what we're saying to be about like, oh yeah, you know, like, no one needs to wear a mask, people can do whatever they want, um, you know. And I'm just sort of thinking about uh, sort of empathy and like infrastructures that encourage empathy versus say competition or othering um, and how that affects our response, right? So like a person who isn't wearing a mask isn't necessarily practicing what I would call self-care, um, depending on what they're doing, right? Like if they're trying to access intimacy, then maybe, <laughs> right? But if they are saying like, oh, I don't care about what's happening and I don't care about you, then it's not, right? So like the action is not you know, the same action means different things in different contexts. And I'm sort of wondering how we're in this place where it is so scary and uh, to sort of I, be vulnerable and like communicate about illness and st status, whatever that is, you know, like sickness, stat like, you know, like, like t how, how it's so such a scary thing for us to talk about, um, you know, like our physical condition as a precursor to intimacy. 
and I think Sri, that goes back to what you were saying about the doctors being all freaked out that people would be able to have unprotected sex without consequence, right? There's a lot of sort of like shame in that. Um, and then also there's this other piece where it's like, I think because, and we even saw it with the response to COVID where states, individual states literally had to compete for resources, right? to like buy the PPE, to like get it shipped to their hospitals, right? Um, you know, we're, we're in this system where mutual aid is discouraged because it, people think that it means they lose something, right? Like there's this finite amount of help <laughs> or assistance or generosity. And if, and if we afford that to someone else, we lose, right? And so there's a whole bunch of stuff there, but um, yeah, you know, like how, how do these infrastructures encourage or discourage kind of like a more understanding and balanced and sort of like intimate approach to being well and take and self care and community care? Okay, so like there's like there's like 17 million things in there. Um, I just, I, I, like I want to get to some of them at least, but I just want to make sure that I'm like clear about what it is that I'm saying, because I think that it's possible that what I have said is a little bit misconstrued. Mm -hmm. I am not advocating for people to not wear masks. Oh, no, no. <laughs> um, in the same way that I wouldn't advocate, that I wouldn't advocate for people to not wear condoms to protect themselves from a whole bunch of things. Maybe they don't want to get pregnant. Maybe they don't want to get chlamydia. So, I mean, like there's a bunch, right? At the same time, what I'm trying to draw our attention to is what is the problem that we are solving for? Mm -hmm. And I think that sometimes the encouragement of condom use in the same way as the encouragement, I'm not not so much of mask wearing, but like, if, if the question that I worry that we're trying to solve right now is, how can we stop people from gathering together? Because people want to naturally gather together. How can we stop them from doing that so that we don't spread COVID? And, uh, how can we use every scientific and infrastructural and, and, and out of the box thinking to, to develop ways that people can get together again. And similarly, like, I feel like prep took a long time for us because we weren't solving for how, like the, what we were, what we weren't elevating. What we want to try to get to is people to be able to be as intimate with each other in any way. That's what I mean by that. And again, like solving for that, like not how can we get people to blah, blah, blah. How can we make sure that it is as easy as possible for people to do the things that human beings like need for affiliation? Like, Intimacy, those are, these are our basic human needs. Like some would argue that they're almost more, I mean, like you could talk about Maslow, but like some people would argue that they're even more. How can we make, how, how can we try to, um, to, to, to make systems that enable that as much as possible in this? And masks actually are an awesome way of doing that because it allows me to be with you. Um, and not um, potentially expose you. Anyway, but the other thing that I wanted to talk about, about self-care, and then I'm, I'm interested in Nisha's take on this too. I mean, and social care so isn't, is because people are selfish. Um, and I think that like we have to like own that and sort of be in there. But the other thing I think is because I don't think it is, by accident that we are talking about COVID and we are talking, not that so many of us have not been talking about white supremacy culture for many, many years, but the, the, the larger conversation, these are not unrelated things. Who 
is able to self-care. Usually those conversations about who is able to self-care is a very elite group of human beings. To me, and this is like, like too much about me, but like in terms of my identity, as actually somebody who's like religious and spiritual identity is very important to them, self-care is specifically about making yourself strong to enable you to work for the world. That that is the, the goal of self-care. It's not just like, oh, I'm just, and that's what sort of Nisha was talking about before. Like if too many people are coming at you, you can't be there for them. You can't be that infrastructure. But privileging the self-care as something that is outside of community, to me, is that's, why, that's where that false dichotomy lies. Well, 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 your statement was really deep and thick, but it took trial and error to get us to PrEP. It took trial and error to get us to HIV medications, ARVs. It took us steps to get there. It took us science. It took us mobilizing for you equals you. Preventionaccess.org paved the way, Bruce Richmond paved the way, but it didn't happen overnight, right? The infrastructures had to kind of be put in place strategically and education, encouraging understanding, having dialogue, um, all of that mattered in those infrastructure pieces, pieces and the correct messaging. You know, you have to make sure that you have that correct messaging, messaging to reduce stigma, to reduce isolation. You're coming into these new communities, these new indigenous uh, populations, marginalized communities, and you can't shame, blame, and, and throw fault and guilt on them. Um, and you can't criminalize them in a way um, that will ultimately feel like they're defeated, right? We have to make sure that we say it plain, we come for our acts, and we get in and we get out. But we have to do that over a period of time to prove ourselves. So um, provability is acceptance. It's accountability. Um, it's like a plan, do, study, act, a PDSA cycle to improve the quality of care of people's lives. Um, COVID-19 is a PDSA cycle. Looking at the trends over a period of time, looking at the marginalized communities over a period of time, and we know that Blacks were affected. We know that 89.5% of our population was Blacks. Um, and we failed our community um, as individuals um, because they did not want to listen to the experts that have been in this over decades and doing the work. Our infrastructures that we're doing now, having this dialogue to educate people, to deepen their horizons, to deepen their knowledge base for reasonings. You know, because people are looking for questions to be answered effectively um, from an expert or a subject matter um, stance. And, and, and keeping that gatekeeper mentality to overall, to mobilize, to make change. You know, that viral load suppression that we so long for, for people living with HIV, to make sure that their viral loads were suppressed over a period of time for six months or greater to prove that you equal you is really what it is. And it's really working. And, and to get their partners on PrEP as quickly as possible, but also educating and encouraging. And, and the facts that we have, they matter, you know, it matters. Um, and being a part of the process, a lot of times our community-based organizations don't want to be a part of the process. And, you know, it took a long time for individuals who wanted to talk about sex and sexual health to even get into the schools. You know, and especially when you have a son or a daughter that may come to you and say, mom, I like girls. You have a mother or a father that's going to throw that child out to the streets. And one of the community-based organizations have to, pay to make sure this young woman is able to be afforded um, resale. That mother or father comes from a certain era is not equipped with the education of the mobilization of the new millennials, the next generation or the new generation of young people who are out there um, trying to make lives for themselves um, and, 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 and hone in on their self identity because we're, we can't dehumanize them because this is what he or she uh, has outed and came out the closet to be. You know, they want to be their own selves, their own selves, you know, their own identity. They don't want to fake it till they make it. 
Because you know what? That isolation will kill that individual quicker than being who they are, that trueness. And, you know, for me, I walk in my transparency, no matter who or what thinks of me, I'm walking through my transparency and my truth, because you know what, ultimately, like Andrew said, it's going to help someone being bold, being fierce, being a badass, mobilizing in your community. They're tired of seeing your face, they're going to see my face again. But you know what, I build relationships in that matter, no matter what, you know, I look at um, my city. Um, as the infrastructure of the fast track cities. You know, last year we, we, we signed on a dotted line for the Paris Declaration to mobilize in our community to, re, to reduce stigma, eradicate, help our communities prevention, treatment and care and access. You know, we passed the bill here for Medicaid expansion in Missouri. That's phenomenal work, but it didn't happen overnight. So those infrastructures that we fuel to bring balance to our world and our community provides unity for all. Yeah. Thank you for that. Hey, you got one more question for us? Yeah, I actually have, there's two questions here and they could actually be, they've been partially answered, but they could actually be synthesized as well. And uh, I, before I, um, before I forget and before I ask these questions, I think I want everybody listening to look up a few terms that we've been using and acronyms. One is PREP, P-R-E-P, -E right? Which is pre-exposure pre prophylaxis. And um, uh, just look it up. If you, if that, that's all I'm gonna, you know, just you act, you, like everybody on the planet needs to know what this is. And it's kind of, I continually find it shocking that so many people don't, but um, I think again with, I, what we were saying about identity, it goes really far to show as to like who thinks, who people with information think need to hear it and what kind of, and I guess in terms of people without information, how they seek and acquire it, right? According to their identity. Um, also look up U equals U. It means undetectable equals untransmissible. Um, there are a lot of stories in the news about like, a miracle patient that like gets cured of HIV maybe every five years or so and you find out that it's because they were going under some almost deadly cancer treatment that like no one should have to go through um, that just happened to kill off <laughs> HIV as well right um, but U equals U is a real thing that happens all the time which is when you reach an untransmittable or undetectable viral, viral load um, HIV then also becomes untransmittable. You won't get it from that person, like you will not. Um, so look up U equals U. Um, and uh, also look up- hey, Yeah. Hey, this is Nisha. I just want to pause for a moment, for a moment of silence for Tim Brown. He has been our expert. He has been a world-renowned um, person, human being that passed away at three o'clock yesterday due to underlying the health conditions associated with leukemia. And he was the first, the Berlin patient that was cured of HIV for the bone marrow transplant. So I do want to just take pause for a moment of silence for him. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, so yeah, look up Tim Brown as well um, after this today. Um, and uh, yeah, I just going off of that, um, we have two questions. Uh, one person is asking um, sort of about, uh, uh, they just have a question about the, the use of condom use being analogous to masks um, in terms of HIV prevention and COVID prevention. Um, as in, they're not that fun to wear or use, but the science of what they do is real. When people advocate for people to choose their own safety protocols, um, is that, you know, without acknowledge of that, without acknowledgement of that very real set of scientific circumstances, isn't that dangerous? We have a second question, which is related. Um, how has your thinking about harm reduction been evolving in this moment? And uh, I do just want to, um, say that going off of my little tear on looking up what PrEP and U equals U is, um, the whole point of the PrEP conversation was that uh, PrEP is a medication that makes HIV um, 
uh, the person taking it like will not get HIV, like it will not um, take hold in their body. Um, but there's also a sort of analog of that for people who already have HIV, which is TRAP, treatment as prevention. Um, so there's a similar drug that completely suppresses HIV to an undetectable and untransmittable level, um, in which case that person could have sex without a condom and not transmit HIV. So I think what we're getting into about the mask condom analogy gets a little tricky because we're talking about multiple technologies um, and multiple means and circumstances under which things are transmitted. And the condom and the mask end up becoming symbolic of like a total solution or like as a stand-in for a person doing the right thing where there's actually a lot of different things that could be happening. And again, like with what Sarit was saying, uh, even if you are on PrEP or TRAP or whatever, there are actually still a whole bunch of reasons why you could or should wear a condom that are non-HIV related. Um, and so it's a little more complicated than that. And that's sort of what harm reduction and risk management are, is kind of like thinking about the sum total of your desires and your actions and your situation and your resources and the impact that all happens has on the people around you. Um, so, uh, and, you know, versus say the war slash shame slash like <laughs> whatever you want to call it kind of um, dialogue. So uh, I'll get off of that soapbox and let people respond quickly and then we'll wrap. Um, yeah. I think that th that the answer to both of those questions has to do with the locus of action. And so for me as an individual, like, and, and the ways in which there's like individuals, there are individuals in interaction with each other. And then there is some type of like public health infrastructure. And in this instance, I'm going to I'm going to bestow the public health infrastructure with the most benevolent um, goals possible. For me as an individual, um, the issues of my own behavior and keeping myself as safe as possible and acting ethically to keep others as safe as possible, I think that the potentially the analogy between um, mask and condom is very apt. And again, sort of A, as you talked um, about the, the, to the extent that I am able to uh, understand um, exposure and, and have an honest conversation with folks that I might choose to wear a condom or not use a condom or wear a mask and not use a mask with, that's at the individual level. At the, at the public health level, I just continually want to say that I think that there is a different, that, that harm reduction is about trying to facilitate healthful, but scientifically based healthful behavior while recognizing the multifaceted reasons why people are able to and not able to engage in that behavior in any one um, situation. And I think that the problem is when the individual and the like societal or the public health become imbued in some type of social person who is telling other people what to do. And I think that that is potentially what, um, I think that's where the sort of shame and, and social control comes in that, that same question of like, why can't you just, why can't you just? And I, I can't, I just can't, like, like I, I think it's sort of like understanding because there's a million, like that's not the question, why can't you just? The question is, how can I help you? <laughs> what would make it easier for you to? And that's the harm reduction question, which is not to say harm reduction is like, it's a, like we still want people, we want people to brush their teeth, we want people to floss, we want people to exercise, we want people to, to sleep well, right? But like, at, but what we need to banish, like, why can't you just? It's hard to come behind that one. <laughs> 
<laughs> Girl, you rocked it. But I did all everything that Sarit said because it goes back to those bedside manners. When you come into my room, I'm here for a procedure, and you see someone sitting cat a corner of me. Do you ask the question, is it okay for the person to be in the room? Mm -hmm. Or do you go say, we have a 42-year-old young lady. She's HIV positive. She has two breasts. And, and not <laughs> think about the other person sitting in the room. So with that being said, you have to caution the language. Language matters, especially when people are coming to access care. I want to feel like a human being, not an object. I want to feel like a human being, not an object. So when I step into the space to receive any type of services, I have to always make sure that I identify who I am by first name. I. I am Nishi Parkinson today. That's what matters for me. And I think that's what matters for human beings who walk in any type of service division. If it's Urban League, if it's, if it's Salvation Army, um, St. Louis Housing Authority, any of those components that we uh, work in the community as social workers or non-social workers or representation matters. It matters more to the person on the other side of the desk than the delivery. Because if a woman comes in as a trans woman, but on her ID, it says Mark, but you see with your eye, your vision, your lenses, that she is a Marquita, then you need to address her as Marquita versus Mark or ask her what her preferred pronouns are. How may I address you today? And build that relationship because you're going to see Marquita again and again and again. And I know it's uncomfortable because some people walk in different eras, but accept the person for who they are not what you see, accept them for who they are. Because when you see their appearance, you see their heart from the inside out. And I, in closing, I wanna just say thank you. But I wanna read something to the audience today that really spoke to me. I had an opportunity to be a part of a Write, Speak, and Release um, initiative. And we talked about unity. Unity is a language that comes from unite. Being a unit equals equation of the world. Unity is divided by race, social determinant, feelings, and creed. Unity can be amplified in colors to capture strength from trauma. When unity is broken, it's hard to believe unity and unite cultures together. Let's unite. Thank you. Unity is amplified in color. I like that. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, I guess, um, uh, yeah, I want to thank everybody for participating. Um, thank you, Sri. Thank you, Nishi. Thank you, Ted. Thanks to Andrew. Um, I forgot to mention Andrew had to uh, cut out for um, uh, like an urgent meeting. Um, in the middle. So um, for the audience, that's where he went. <laughs> um, but sends his regards. Uh, definitely catch up um, with him through his work. Um, he has a lot of books out, so go read them. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm going to, before we go, I'll flash a little, another little card um, at the end <clears throat> if anyone is interested in donating to Headlands for further programming, or if you just liked what you saw today, um, and uh, our website and all of that, um, and uh, headlands.org slash support. <laughs> um, but uh, most of all, yeah, I just want to thank everyone here in the audience for participating. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't know, Ted, did you want to close with anything or? Yeah, maybe just um, a brief word um, that kind of responds to the harm reduction and the mm -hmm. question about condoms and mm -hmm. masks. I hope that today's conversation showed the, the kind of warmth and power that comes by putting things in conversation together. We don't need to compare them or contrast them. They don't need to be metaphors or analogies. They can just be beautiful whole things on their own. And I'm really grateful for spending time with all of you today. I learned a lot. Um, I have to change my mind about a few things, which is really exciting. And I love changing my mind in public. That's what we need to do. 
And I just want to say thank you, A and Headlands. Um, you know, art, often people think that art is a way to find answers, but I think art is also a way to find the questions. And I'm really grateful for you for making that space for us today. So thank you. Of course. Um, it's been a pleasure. And um, yeah, I guess that's it. I'll see you all soon, hopefully. <laughs> bye, Nishi. I hope I get to. Bye. bye. Thanks, everyone who joined us today. Bye yeah. for now. Thank you all. <laughs>